Welcome to the fifth episode of Marxism Today podcast. My name is Nate, I'll be your host today, and something new, we're going to be joined by two other hosts. Hello! I'm Thad Logan. I have my podcasting hat on. I'm ready for this. And I'm Matt Stanky. Thad and Matt will be here to play the role of co-host and audience. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be asking questions. They're going to be uh, providing clarification, maybe analogies, things like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, They'll also be fulfilling co-host functions. So, I don't know. Making a joke at my expense or something. I will just be asking questions, <laughs> honestly. Questions about Marx, right? We, you want us to ask about Marxism and Marx? Yeah. Would he like, be attracted to me? Like that? Is that a good question? <laughs> Would that be a good question? Well, our topic today will be commodities, and maybe we can lead into uh, yeah. attraction. You know, Marx didn't have a lot to say about attraction. Yeah, well... Um, we'd need Freud for that, I think. <laughs> I'll have some more questions pertaining to this, but yeah. So good, we can ask you questions, and that's. I just wanted to make sure we had the ground rules set. So into commodities. Okay. I'm ready. I'm Great. totally ready for this. Good Man, question. are you ready for this? I'm ready. So uh, commodities are going to play a big part in our Marxist criticism. Um, commodities aren't everything. So there, there are a lot of things, but they're not everything. A commodity is something that is produced to be sold. Mm-hmm. So if uh, you... Um, if if you grow tomatoes in your backyard and you eat them, that's not a commodity. And if you um, bake some cookies and you give them to your kids or your friends, whoever, those aren't commodities either. Now, can a commodity be a service or does it have to be a tangible product? That's a good point. So, commodities, yeah. the, mo- the most common commodities that you're going to think of are products like everything in a grocery store is a commodity, everything in Best Buy and Walmart and all these other big box stores, yeah. those are all commodities. Commodities are also services, like Thad pointed out. So, uh, every time you buy a haircut, you're buying a commodity. Mm-hmm. Every time, I don't know, you get a massage or whatever, or uh, you see a therapist, you're buying a commodity. Uh, so, those are the things that commodities are. Now uh, we're going to get into two different two different parts of a commodity or two different ways of looking at a commodity um, and these are both different values that they have. The first is a use value and this is what um, this is what most people are concerned with when they're concerned about a commodity. They want to know what can I do with it or mm. uh, what good is it to me mm. so the use value of a television would be uh, porn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, I don't know what you were asking me questions. Uh, but, or like the use value of a meal at a restaurant right. would be to eat it. Can okay, I just... Yeah. All right, but so it could be a restaurant. I'm sorry. Okay. Here we're going. Uh, so there's the use value to a commodity. Mm-hmm. And uh, even things that aren't commodities have use values, like the tomatoes we mentioned earlier that you grow in your backyard and you yeah. eat. That has a use value. Yeah. Uh, same with... Uh, anything that you do for someone, but without selling it, it still has a use value. Now, commodities are only going to have the second kind of value, and that's exchange value. So that's the value that something has when you sell it. In other words, what it's worth to sell. Um, In early uh, market economies, there wasn't always money at first. So the question was, okay, how much of one commodity equals another commodity? How many bushels of wheat can I trade for a pair of shoes? But there was always this issue of trying to figure out, okay, well, what is the exchange rate? How do you know how many to do? Mm-hmm. And there's... Well, what Marx tells us is that if you can exchange one commodity for another, they must have something similar in common. There, there must be something that is similar about these two. Uh, now, many commodities have a weight. Mm-hmm. So could it be based on their weight? Well, not always, because the shoes might weigh a lot less than all the bushels of wheat you need to trade for them, so weight is out. (laughs) Could it be color? They all have color. But all of these things... That's just stupid. Yeah. So (laughs) what could it possibly be that all commodities have in common? Mm -hmm. And the thing that Marx finally settles on is human labor time. They all take time to make. And so the idea is, if it takes... On average, eight hours to make a pair of shoes, 
then the amount of wheat you trade for it is the amount of wheat you can make in eight hours on average. Obviously, it takes a whole season mm-hmm. to grow wheat, but if you divide it all down, you get how much wheat per eight hours that you put in, and that's what it is. Now, what I mean, there's certain things that aren't going to work out this way, right? Like, say I'm a really slow worker and I take two days to make my shoes. Yeah, you do. Well, problem is I can only trade them at the what. Marx calls socially necessary labor. Right. In other words, what is the average time? Mm-hmm. So, like, if all shoemakers happen to be lazy and all take two days, then it's all fine because the average is two days. Right. But assuming that they're not all lazy and yeah. that most of them make them in one day, if I'm lazy and it takes me two days, right. then I can still only trade it for one day's worth of work for yeah. any commodity. Or if you tweak out on meth and you do, like, triple their output, you make you make some more money. Exactly. More meth. Now, this... this um, this tends to work perfectly in a scenario where each worker makes their own thing and brings it to market. Right. There's going to be some problems with this later, but we won't get into them right now. And in this sort of like um, valuing the commodities, th- these kind of things would happen naturally in the past. Then, because really, I mean, you just you wouldn't give yourself you wouldn't give your six shoes away for any wheat you felt you didn't deserve. I mean, you would sort of decide these things actually, right? Exactly. And actually, here's here's an interesting thing, because um, if you've taken an economics course, when I said, how are those prices determined, you might have said, well, it's by supply and demand. Right. And this answer is the same as the supply and demand answer. Supply and demand is actually an assumption to this answer. Okay. So... If you say supply and demand, it's like, yes, okay, so if there's, if someone really needs shoes, they'll trade more, and if someone really needs wheat, they'll trade more. If they have enough shoes, then they won't trade anything for shoes, right? Mm-hmm. But f- somehow, an average price gets worked out. Mm-hmm. So supply and demand make it go up and down and up and down and up and down, but if it reaches what's called an equilibrium point, and if you draw supply and demand graphs, you can always find the equilibrium point on there. Yeah. And the question is... How do we get to that equilibrium point? How do we know that, on average, a shoe is going to trade for eight pounds of wheat or whatever it is? Right. It's because of the labor time that it takes to put into it. And if you look at earlier societies, it's very interesting. Earlier societies have understood this very well. So, in certain pre-money societies, you'll see that uh, the say a, a blacksmith might do some work for someone else might make something for them but during that time that the blacksmith is making that for that other person that person has to has to work the blacksmith's fields okay but uh so yeah you could see how this works out in the sense of labor time like they have to do work (coughs) during the time equal amount of time that it takes the blacksmith to do that work it's pretty intuitive and it's it's something it's a force that people assume takes place now too it's the same it's the same idea just simplified then but we all assume that things are are still prevail i mean we we assume we're still on being pushed by the winds of supply and demand right yeah as supply and demand is is still functioning in many ways today Mm -hmm. as as much as there is competition so there's a lot less competition today than there was before so that's going to mess up supply and demand supply and demand works better if there's more competition sure but um to the extent that there is a certain amount of competition, there's uh, still the effects of supply and demand. Okay. And the amount of labor that goes into something still has a large influence on its um, price, on what it trades for. Now, some of the things that are going to obscure this are going to be things like the amount of machinery. So... If you introduce a big, powerful machine, you might need only one person where you needed a hundred before. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that there's less value because there's only one person's time? Well, no, because the machine being used means that it was probably took a lot of people to produce that machine. The cost of the machine is, again, cost of people working. Now, it's more efficient probably with the machine. So there's still, even if you add in the cost of the machine... Uh, and all the people it took to make that machine, and the person to operate it, it's going to be less than the original. Like that's why you move to a new industry, or right. to, why you make the change. And and is is there also something that can change it? A factor you have the the value of the worker is decreased. Like when you outsource shoes to a twelve year old Laotian boy, and you pay him less, and the shoes are cheaper. 
what does that really say about the value of them? Yeah, exactly. So one of the things, if if you outsource in order to get cheaper labor, uh, what it means is that you get to probably you're going to do a little bit of both of these, but these are the two things you can do. Mm. You can lower the price and, or increase your profits. Probably you'll find a happy medium between those two because you if you're not increasing <laughs> your profits, there's no reason to yeah. do it. But if you don't lower the price, then you might not be able to sell it as much more as you need to. Right. So in order to compete with your competitors, you lower the price a little bit, but then you also keep a little bit for yourself. I always like to find the happy medium between child labor and competition. Yeah. That was, that was, this, you'd be a good co- capitalist then. Oh yeah. you were like, I always look at a kid and I'm like, well, how much could I exploit you? What would make me happy? <laughs> yeah, I get it. Oh, I shouldn't get close to the mic. Um, okay, so we've Cover covered that. use value, exchange value, uh, okay. and um, how the two things can be exchanged. So the thing that they have in common, like we said, is human labor put into them. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I want to cover before we move on is who's interested in what kind of value. So it's always the consumer that's interested in the use value. Okay, so when we go into a store, we're always looking, oh, I want to, I'm I'm hungry for this thing, so I'm going to buy whatever it is, an apple. I'm hungry for an apple, so I'm going to buy this apple. I'm yeah. interested in the use of it, which is to eat it and feed me and to taste good, things like that. Yeah. Uh, or when I need a car so that I can get around town, I'm not interested in selling that car for mm-hmm. something. I'm interested in buying it and its ability to drive around and things like that. Who's interested in the exchange value of items? Well, the person selling them. So this is not going to be the producer. Okay, the producer just makes the item. It does, the producer doesn't sell it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in the sense of the worker. So when we go to work and we, a lot of us provide service for someone or have some sort of role that, uh, in an in industry that makes either a service or a good, we're not entirely concerned with the exchange value the person that is is the person that gets the revenue from that Mm -hmm. so the board of directors the capitalist the boss whatever the bourgeoisie there's all these different names for it the most common today you could think of it as the people running the corporation the Mm -hmm. ceo or the board of directors yeah so that's the person concerned mainly with the exchange value of the thing they don't care what it does or what good it is to anyone you know if it has you know if the use value is worthless it doesn't matter to them they'll make it as long as the exchange value is there right 